Now, before we get on to the subject of expanded octets, let's just remind ourselves of the basics of the octet rule or the octet guideline, as I prefer to call it. Roughly speaking, atoms will lose, gain or share electrons to get a full outside valence shell. Remember that valence electrons are the electrons on the outside of atoms, the ones that we use in chemistry. Now, remember that we should also have a doublet rule and a Decker octet rule for the first rows and the fourth and so on rows of the periodic table. But we focus on the octet rule because it is a nice balance of being simple, of illustrating the principles of quantum shells and actually being useful. However, Problems arise when we try to apply the octet rule to molecules like the sulfate anion, phosphorus pentachloride, silicon hexafluoride, and so on. And you can see here that these central atoms have more than the eight valence electrons that they're allowed to have by the octet rule. The phosphorus atom has 10, and the sulfur and silicon atoms both have 12. These are called hypervalent compounds. In other words, at least one of the atoms has got more valence electrons than it's allowed by the octet rule. But also, why only 10 electrons for phosphorus in phosphorus pentachloride, but 12 for sulfur and silicon in their compounds? Well, very simply, the octet rule has failed us. Now, if we really want to explain these hypervalent compounds, we either need to move up to a more complex theory of molecular bonding called molecular orbital theory, or we have to go back to the octet rule and make that more complicated so that it can explain what's going on. My preference is to go with the molecular orbital theory. That said, for most people, and that includes professional chemists, the octet rule, together with its flaws, is good enough for most applications. Now, our biggest problem is that most explanations of hypervalent compounds or expanded octets are post hoc. In other words, we discover a molecule that doesn't form bonds in the way we expect it to, and then we try to explain why that happened. But these kinds of rules are not really useful. A good scientific rule should enable us to predict what will happen. In other words, we should be able to predict not only what kind of hypervalent molecules will be possible, but we should be able to explain properly why other molecules can't do this. And this is where our simple octet rule falls short. So is there at least a simple and understandable way to predict when we are likely to see an expanded octet? I think so. Our first point is that the central atom must be large enough to allow more than four atoms around it. That basically means period three downwards. Nitrogen can make compounds with three oxygens or fluorines around it, whereas chlorine, for example, can make molecules with five fluorines attached to it, and the very large iodine can get seven fluorines around it. Our second point is that the, the ligands, the atoms formed around that central atom, should be highly electronegative. In other words, they should come from elements that are strong oxidizing agents. Electronegativity, oxidizing agents, link in the description. Now, this high electronegativity has two roles. First of all, it means that these outer atoms can force that central atom to share its electrons. But what they also do is lower the energy of the orbitals on that central atom and make it easier for electrons to sit in the middle of the two atoms and form a bond. 
So, if we go back to our traditional explanation of expanded octets, the idea that these third row elements and beyond have a d orbital that they can put electrons into, well, the electronegativity of those outer atoms now kind of explains things. That d orbital can now be pulled down in energy by those electronegative atoms on the outside which means that electrons can sit in them quite easily. Why don't we fill the whole d orbital with electrons? Because there isn't enough space to get more atoms around the outside. And why not put electrons into the 4s orbital, which is lower in energy than the 3d orbital? Well, that's because it's only lower in energy in a free atom. As soon as we try and make a compound, that 4s orbital is higher in energy. So now we can see why we can make the PO4 anion, but not the NO4 anion. Firstly, nitrogen is too small to get those four oxygen atoms around it. But also, the next orbital up from our two 2s and 2p orbitals is the 3s orbital. And that's much further away than the 3d orbital is from the 3s orbital. And oxygen simply isn't electronegative enough to bring that 3s orbital down, bring it close enough for making a compact. So we can also perhaps predict whether or not we could get the nitrogen equivalent of the sulfate ion. Now we're starting with sulfur as the central atom, so it's large enough to expand its octet. But when we look at the nitrogen atoms themselves, nitrogen is not as electronegative as oxygen. In fact, it's more like chlorine, and chlorine doesn't form expanded octets with sulfur either. So what about I3, triiodide? Look. Don't get me started on triiodide. It's just weird. It's got this hypervalent central iodine atom. Its iodine is so big and flabby, it can't hold on to its electrons properly anyway. It's halfway to being a metal, except that it's still trying to be a halide. Even molecular orbital theory tries to explain triiodide as having a, a three center, four electron bond, whatever that means. Even the name's weird. Triiodide, triiodide, don't get me started on iodine. But anyway, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if my explanation is flawed because the whole concept of the octet rule being a rule is flawed. In my opinion, molecular orbital theory makes a much better explanation of these kinds of molecules. But molecular orbital theory is so complicated that you need a computer to work out what's going on. And complicating valence theory to make sure that it still fits the octet rule just means that we are explaining things after they've happened and not predicting them before they've happened. So at the end of the day, you've got a choice. You either stick with the simple but flawed octet guideline, or you invest time in learning either molecular orbital theory or more complicated versions of the octet rule, or maybe even a mixture of both. And then maybe you will have to invest more time and money in modeling software and expensive computers to run that modeling software. For most people, the relatively few flaws of the octet rule are the best compromise. And for an alternative explanation that strikes a balance between being too complicated and being too simple, check the link in the description. As always, if you found this video helpful, please click the like button. And if you subscribe, you'll know when the videos come out. Everyone's a winner. So at the end of the day, you've got a choice or you can learn. So at the end of the day, you can stick with or 
So at the end of the day, so at the end of the, so at the end of the day, you've got a choice. 